Good morning, everyone. Praise the Lord. I want to share with you something that God's been teaching me. I'm still learning. I'm uh, nowhere near uh, mastering, but it's something that God's been teaching me. So uh, what I'm sharing with you today, I'm nowhere sharing from a point of uh, accomplishment, but from what I'm learning, I'm sharing, you, sharing with you my journey that God's been having me on for the past probably uh, almost 12 months, almost 12 months now. And, then what is, and what I want to share about is what, what is biblical, what is biblical manhood? What, what is biblical manhood? When I, when I got married, I really realized real quickly I, I didn't know as much as I thought I knew <laughs> of what it meant to be a man. <laughs> And then we found out we were pregnant real quick, and then, then the pressure's really on. I'm like, oh boy, I have a child coming, and I gotta learn real quick of what it means to be a man. And, and so I'm gonna share with you what God's taught me over the past 11 months, and what I'm still learning, what I'm still pressing into. Because I feel like in the world in general, manhood has been lost, and it's, and it, and and what was there uh, 200 years ago has, has it, we've even declined more. So what, what, we, what we had before has become less, even though that was not the totality of what it was. So in the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth, and he formed out of the dust, he formed a man in the image of God. And God made one person from the dust, and he never went back. Every human being from that has never been made from the dust. Only one man has been made from the dust. And from the man, he reached in and pulled out a woman. And by doing that, the man, he made the man, and out of the man, he pulled forth the woman. So the man is now what is now the source of the human race. So whatever you're, you, you are the source of, like God is the source of all living things, you are also in charge of. So by God making the woman out of the man, he made the man the source, the solution, the leader of the human race. And so that's why it's not that God thinks that men are better than women, and that's why God always, whenever he wanted to bring change, he would always go to a man because the man is the source. He's the, the starting point for the human race. That's why he went to Abraham. That's why he got 12 disciples. It wasn't that God was, was sexist, but it's because he made the man to be the source, to be the leader. So a society, a culture, a business, a family, a country is only as good as the men that are in it. Because the man is the source where, where everything came from and still comes from. The man carries the, the next generation within him. And that's why God counted the fathers. When he did the genealogies, it was the father to the father to the father to the father because the man was the source. From Adam to the present day, Adam was the source. And so the man continues to be the source. So whatever a man does... Whatever a man believes, whatever a man says, affects, can affect a whole culture, can affect a whole nation, can affect a whole people. And he carries the whole, his next generation between his loins. Whatever he does is no longer a private affair. The, whole gen, the next generations are affected by that and are present. So what... What were men created to do? What did God give to a man? The responsibilities of man. In the beginning, in Genesis, he put man in the garden and he said, I want you to dress it and keep it. And dress in strong means to work, to cultivate, and keep means to guard, to hedge about. So two of the primary, primary responsibilities of man are to, to cultivate and to guard. 
And then later we see in, in 1 Corinthians 11.3 that God has made the man to be the head. So it's also leading. So what does it mean for a man to guard, to protect, to head to bow? Every, every person, every man, every boy has this natural um, desire to fight, to, to guard. Whatever little boys get together, they always wrestle or find some rough sport to engage in because they have a natural desire to protect, to fight. So whatever, they, whatever is important to them is what they fight for, whatever they, they build their life around. So if we've been, if as men, we build our life around the wrong thing, we'll end up fighting for and uh, tearing down the wrong people, the wrong things, because we're guarding the wrong thing. If we base our life around what God says in his word, base our lives around the, the woman, women, and we guard that in our lives, the enemy and his kingdom will be destroyed. So, it's very important because God gave Adam the garden, which is his, and he also gave him his wife to guard and protect. So, so often in society and, and in the world and in the church, men get this, this mindset that, well, I'm, I'm the head, I get, I get to lead. And what they end up doing is they're basing their whole life around this theology and hedging about this theology and tearing down everyone, everyone under them. Because they're trying to maintain, well, I'm the leader, I'm, I'm the head of this home. I'm the pants of this home. <laughs> Which is all true. But if you're tearing down the people you're supposed to be leading, you're not leading. If a man who uses his own strength for his own purpose is no man, but a selfish boy. He's going to use that power in his life to tear down other people. God gave him, that man that desire to guard and protect, to uplift, to protect those who are weaker. Like it says in, in, uh, in Corinthians, that, or in the New Testament, that meant to honor the woman as the weaker vessel. That's why God made women weaker, and men have a bigger body and a stronger body to uplift, to protect, to hedge about. So God's called men to rise up and to protect those things that are of him, protect women, protect the children, protect the family, protect the church, and to fight all that, and protect and defeat all that is of the enemy. And that's what Adam did was wrong. Adam committed the first sin and by not protecting his wife. So instead he let his wife go out and do her thing and he just kind of followed along and he didn't defend her and protect her. And therefore, he, but he just kind of followed along and did whatever. And he, he didn't obey the original command of God to hedge about, to protect, and to train his wife in the word. Secondly, it talks about to dress, to work, to cultivate. Men are created to cultivate. So whatever, whatever a man touches, whatever a man should be involved in, should get better because he's in it. Your, your wife... If you're married, she become better every year because you're cultivating her. You're working in her to make her better. It's your, your duty to make her better. Your business should get better because you're touching. Your children should get better because you're there. Your goal is to cultivate your children. Like you can, if we read in 1 Timothy 1.6, it says, this is called the qualifications for a bishop, for a a leader in the church. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful choose children, not accused of riot or unruly, rebellious, disobedient. Your children cannot be accused of being disobedient if you want to be in the church. Because what it's saying there is that your children, your family, is a picture of the man that you are. How your children turn out, how your family turns out, is a picture of the man that you are. Because it's saying right there that if your children are not in line, then you can't be in a church. Because how are you going to learn how to lead the church of God if you can't lead your own family, it says. Because we're created to be cultivators. We're created to cultivate whatever we touch so it become better. As a challenge to all of us men that with our families, uh, I've been challenged myself with and trying to reorder my priorities 
so that my family can be cultivated and built up. Because if our families fall apart and we have an amazing ministry, it's nothing. We've lost the main focus, like it says right here. You can't, and, and have Paul set it up here. You weren't supposed to even have a ministry if your children could be accused of being disobedient or unruly. So God's calling us men to whatever we touch, especially in the home, especially in our families, to be cultivating, to be making better whatever we touch. And then thirdly, it talks about the man being the head, the head of the family, the head of the woman. And that's not just this, this mindset that's been in the church and uh, that, you know, I'm, I'm the head and everybody else is underneath me and I, I get to make my decisions and pull everyone along. But if we don't, if we look at Jesus, it says Christ is the head of man. God is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of man. Man is the head of woman. So if we look at Jesus as a leader, what is the picture? Is that picture that I'm going to lead my family and pull them along and they're going to do what my vision is, which is good. We should have a vision for our families, but our family is not being built up like Christ builds the church up, like he got down and washed the disciples' feet in humility. If we're not washing our families, if we're not washing those around us in the church, if we're not building them up, then we're no man at all. Our man does nothing. It means nothing if we shoot guns and kill big things and drive big trucks. It's nothing. That's not manhood at all. All that is is just a bunch of testosterone. <laughs> it's nothing. And manhood, manhood is servanthood and lifting up, using our strength, using our power. When men are so powerful, they can just run people right over. But it's using our power and our strength to lift up those that are weaker than us, as Jesus did, to love those who are unlovely, to love those who are rejected, to love our families and make them better because we're the head, to make them better than us, to push them to the vision that God has for them. There is an amazing story of a man who founded um, Focus on the Family. His dad was a traveling evangelist, and his dad was so popular in this denomination, he was booked four years out in advance. And one day, this, this man, Dr. James Dobson, he was a pretty good child growing up, and he, but he went to this party when he hit his, his teen years. And his mom saw him. His dad was out traveling. When he got home, his mom said, where were you? He was like, oh, I was at this party. She said, well, I bet you're never going to do that again. He said, I'm going back. And I'm going to, going to do it again and again. And it was the first time he was ever blatantly rebellious to her. So she called his dad and only said three words. She said, I need you. His dad canceled all four years of all his booking. He bought a train ticket and drove home, sold their house, and got a pastor in a small town so he could be with his son. And his son then went on to found a big ministry that's impacted families today because of his father's faithfulness to, not, to, to focus on his family and to lift his family up instead of going off on his vision and letting his family rot. So God's calling us today. I urge you today. I urge you today to focus on what God's set before you, to cultivate what's before you, to guard what God has put in place, to lift up those that are weaker than you. That's what real manhood is. That's what real manhood is. If we're going to use our power, if we're going to use our strength for our own selfish purposes, that's just disgusting and worthless and wicked. Let's be the men that God's called us to be. Let's lift up those that are weaker. Let's wash the feet of those that need to be washed. Amen. Amen. Amen.